on Green Foot and Java because half an hour is not really the amount of time you need to uh, talk about object oriented programming concepts and also uh, an actual piece of software. So bear with me and um, I'm just going to explain why I use some of the stuff and then demonstrate again a piece of software that, um, that we use and an example of how it can be done. So it's really a 2D development environment to teach object oriented programs, specifically Java. And because you can do games and simulations with it, it's quite engaging for students. So I um, taught at secondary school and have just moved on to FE in, at Christmas. And we used this in the secondary school where I taught for eight years in year nine. Um, and this progressed on from scratch in year seven and Alice in year eight, but using the same kind of project base for each one. So. Um, I didn't bring my Lego, but I normally explain this using pieces of Lego, and I'll just explain why. So, for example, you have how it works is a bit like a kind of school play in the world, which is like your environment, which is really good for kids if you're teaching them who's used to using things like Scratch. And then here you have your actors or your objects, and from that there's like lots of different types of them. And having the actual physical hierarchy shown here. Whereas like, if you're using a programming language like text-based one, that's like Python, you can't see the objects as such. And having this graphical base makes it really easy for actual students to understand. So what I normally do is I get my seven-year-old son's Lego. So he has a little board, because obviously they're too expensive to buy, those green boards. And I use, um, he's got these like, construction men that come in a clear plastic tube. So I have four of those and have a little instruction manual. So what we do is have the white board or the little piece of leg, the flat board as the world. Then we have the clear tube representing the class, which is the blueprint, so all the instructions in there. And every one of those little um, identifiable men go into the world as an object, and then you can move them around um, by adding the methods to it. So you turn the head is a method to turn the head. So I should have brought it with me, it would have been made sense. So, and there are lots of resources as well if you're a teacher actually on the Greenfoot website. There is also um, a video blog that uh, Michael Coling's done, I don't know if you've seen this, and it has lesson resources and it also has then the pedagogy. So it might be talking about methods such as turn and move and then he'll then have a separate video for how you might teach that and why you would do that. So that's really useful from a teacher's perspective. Um, and you can also show that to your students, there's no difference and then they can understand. So sometimes it's quite useful if you want them to actually teach um, the lesson for you. You can give them some resources so they do a little bit of learning prior to it. So just, not, uh, obviously um, if you do have this, this all you can do this task. So, I've got some, we use like lots of different scenarios to teach uh, Greenfoot and one of the ones that comes mainly um, from the book um, which I've changed is like, um, if you've seen this, is uh, crabs and worms. And some of my students found it a little bit kind of um, not really what they were interested in, crabs and worms, even though it does teach you the concept. So we changed it to a zombie shoot em up. Um, this is the girls as well, it wasn't just because there's boys in the class. So what we did was we set um, them to just do certain specific things. So first of all, we had a look at how it actually works. So it's, there's no difference in the level of Java, so there's, it's not a light version of Java, it's just pure Java, so they don't actually kind of miss out on any of the concepts that they're going to be learning. So, which was really good if you're using, um, has anyone used Alice 2.2? No, well that's a 3D um, environment, and you can flip the Lego blocking code that you drag in to actually the pure Java code as opposed to the kind of studio code like you get in Scratch. And that's quite useful sometimes. So then, so then they get to see that prior to you actually moving on to Greenfoot. So that's one way to do it. So we start off with saying, like, we, when we always use the analogy of a player or a movie by using this act method, which is how um, uh, Greenfoot works. So, and then from that they think, well, how am I going to get something to move? So first of all, they need to think of the object that they want, and then they need to think of how they're going to do it. So, and you can see it's very, very simple bits of code. You've just got move three and turn three. So what do you think would happen if you actually hit run on that particular object? What do you think would happen? It just moves and, and turns. So it's based on 
moving however your grid is, is however many sort of pixel blocks. So if you've got a really kind of gridded one, it would move like three massive blocks. If you've got a more high resolution one, it just moves like three little pixels. And that's entirely up to you how you do that. So I'm just going to um, show you the scenario that we use. So let's just Sorry. So here is our version of Greenfoot. This is in the kind of main window. So you've got the renderer here, and then you've got your class hierarchy here. So, so when you're talking about object-oriented programming or any objects like this, it's very easy to see where they're related and what they are by having this visual hierarchy here. And you can see that this is a child of this, so you can talk about all of the actual concepts that are really important when you're doing object-oriented programming. So obviously we've got our hero and our zombie, which is exactly the same as your crab and worm, you just program it um, differently. So what I've done, this is one of my students changed it to look like Minecraft. Um, so for example, it's really good because they can create all of these objects themselves by just using free software. So you could use like pixel art to create the background, you could use any photo editing software. So that's quite useful because it also adds some creativity to it and makes it actually more useful for the students to do. So if you, um, here you've got the main, so this is any of the objects that are in the actual Greenfoot world. And so these are, have to have their own code. And if you just double click on it, you'll, it'll bring up the editor. Now one of the really good things is this syntax highlighting. So you can actually see the code blocks which is quite useful for students because obviously I don't know if you've ever done any Java programming, there's two things that you always miss off, that's your curly bracket and your semicolon. And it's just no matter how, you've been, how long you've been programming, even professional programmers, they still miss off a curly bracket and a semicolon. So it's quite good for them to see because what happens if you take it off, all of, if you miss off this bracket, it then goes into here and you can see, you can see where you've made mistakes. And from a teaching perspective, it's also quite good because you can change the tools and make your um, actual, uh, you go to options and preferences, you can actually increase your font size so that it makes it easier to see in the classroom, which is actually really, really useful when you're looking at code. It's also very useful if you're doing actual kind of virtual teaching as well, which I've done before using Hangouts, and it's quite hard to see code. You have to do sometimes, but in terms of using actual Greenfoot, it's quite good to give them the opportunity to do the, to get them um, actually modifying the code and repurposing it. So the really good um, thing as well is the amount of support in terms of on their Greenfoot website that there is in t for actual teaching this. So. Um, you can see here you've got all of the code indentations and that's how you can actually help them making sure that they've laid out their code correctly. Um, in terms of whether you have your curly bracket here or whether you have it on the second line, depends on how old you are as well. So I'm a bit of an old school one, so mine's below. If you're a bit younger, it tends to be on the line above. But there's no difference in terms of the code compiling. It's just in terms of your preference and generally how old you are or when you learn um, to do some Java programming. So if you can change any of those. And a really good thing is, um, is this is quite important when you're doing I mean, I am taking it really fast and I'm really sorry. I've got all of these resources and I, I need a massive PDF um, which they're going to send out to everyone because actually I think half an hour is not really enough time to go through it. But bear with me and see how we go. So for example, what we try to explain to the students is, here is the main bit of your actual program. This is what it calls automatically all of the time. But if you, ha you want lots of things to happen, it's really good to do here. So if we just highlight this section, we can see here that we want it to fire. Everyone knows what that means. You could have shoot, you could have laser blast, whatever your appropriate name would be, not thing or whatever, which obviously some of the students do. Um, and it's quite helpful for them to take all of their code, work it out, and then do what we call refactoring. So straight away we know that that's going to do something, it's going to fire at something, it's going to kill the zombie, in theory. But what it actually does is do lots of different things. And it's quite interesting, you can see that 
it's actually what what actually the um, fire method does. It's because it's private. It's only called within this object. Okay. Um, you can have public ones. It's the same as having a public variable if you're using Scratch, like using different places. Um, and also in terms of Java, obviously it is case sensitive. So that's quite um, an issue with some students. So that the fact if it's a class, it has to be capital letter. And if it's an object, it's lowercase. So giving them an example of where it's producing is quite helpful. But this is something that they'll probably get wrong initially as well, that they'll not, they'll not capitalize the class and, um, but that's an easy mistake because it comes up with an error. So it actually shows you the error if you do that wrong. So we've called it blob, but it could be laser, blast, or bullets, or whatever. And then you can see that it's calling from the class an object of type blob. And then it wants to create a new one. So every time I fire, I want a new blob to fire up of my hero and kill the zombie. So you can see here, um, I've added in some comments, and there's two ways I normally do this. One is when I give them a, cell, a skeleton structure, and I actually have the instructions in there. And that's really, really helpful, because I don't know if you, when you're teaching, have any instructions on the board, and then you're trying to code, and you're like, actually, and depending on what classroom layout you've got, I mean, I've got quite a good one, but most people are generally not facing the board. Um, they're generally in cramp stuff, so they'll be kind of post or whatever. Um, having the instructions inside the code saves you an awful lot of, I don't get it, where's the help? So, and also another thing is like with the video tutorials from Michael Curling or all the ones that are on YouTube, you can actually put the link in there and they can just copy and paste it and stick it into um, a website um, if you have access to YouTube, should I say. There is some other ones. Um, as well, so you might have to download some videos if you aren't allowed that through your filter, which is a good thing to check before, because I found that it didn't work in one of my classes. <laughs> but it was quite interesting, so it's fine. So, and then, um, and here, having all of these instructions is really useful for them to see that you comment on your code. One of the big things that professional programmers have said to me is that they need to be able to comment on their code, but not comment on every single thing. Comment on things that make sense as if you were, not necessarily for somebody else to use it, but because your ICT lesson or your computing lesson is only once a fortnight or once an hour, so when you go back to it a week later, you know what you're talking about. It's really to prompt you in a way that makes sense so you know where to pick up from, because I find that that's the problem with a lot of lessons, is that you have, you have it once a week for an hour or 50 minutes, and the students forget what they did last week. And this is a really good way of making them actually, it's, just, it's a bit like um, David, um, David Mitchell's one about them actually commenting on their blogs. This is like commenting on their own code. Um, and also from an assessment perspective, you can see, well actually, they wanted it to do this, and their code looks totally, utterly different, which is usually the case, because they can't quite understand what they wanted to do. And you can see, well actually, the comment says, I want it to explode every five seconds and actually they've set it to spin round forever in some deadly embrace that will never end. And you can see straight away, okay, oh, okay, you're trying to do well, what, what does your code through? And you can make them actually work out their own mistakes, which is, so they get to fail, but privately, because we all know teenagers don't actually like failing in public, especially when it's something to do with anything technical. And I found that having the comments in the code is really helpful for them to actually improve their own coding. And also for you, you can quickly put an assessment in, going, oh, that was really good, I really like that, tick, done, marked, any evidence, there you go, Ofsted. So, and it saves you doing the massive write-up um, um, every five minutes. So, and then you can see I haven't changed anything, but I'm gonna take my semicolon off just to show you what happens when you actually compile the code. So, okay, so this is a nice one. It's, in, it's expecting a semicolon, and generally tells you where it should go. Okay, so that's one of the really good benefits of that. That's not all of the error messages aren't that good. I don't know if you've ever seen any error messages in um, any Java programming language. They're very weird. It makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And even if you Google it, it's all too technical. Um, so things like, is it end of line, while, end of file while parsing, generally means you've missed a curly bracket. Um, and it should just say, Mr. Curly Brackets, but it doesn't, it does some crazy weird things. So that's one of the things that are quite funny. So some of the students, 
You can have a lesson on error messaging and basically get them to break their own code and see what cool messages you can come up with. And then get them to come up with names that make sense to them and make a display on the board so that if there's a weird thing that comes up, they can point to it and go, that's what that means. Um, and in terms of the students, you get, again, you, then you're just facilitating as opposed to doing it for them, which is actually quite useful. So, I've now fixed my code. In theory, it should say it's good to go. And it just say file saved. It doesn't say there's any. And you get this, class compiled, no syntax errors, which is what you're hoping for. Um, so, I'll just do that. Um, and it's good to, you can see here, I've actually made a change to my world. So you get straight away, you know that here, that the code is going to actually need um, actually compiling as a whole. So you, instead of I just compiled my own hero, but actually affects the whole world because he's part of it. So therefore you have to compile. So sometimes I get them to save it and close it and just compile back in the main world. So here we have a lovely hero. You can do whatever you like. And then I have zombies. We do have some different ones which actually have zombies in it. Um, and this is the ones that students have modified. So when you run it, as you can see, we had set rotation. So he just moves around. And if I fire, he And you can add sound effects like that. So um, you can see that um, with the students, they can, even though we're all doing the same bit of code, they can actually personalize it, which is really good. And if they're not very good at coding, they might be really, really good at doing graphics. So they can actually, it's really good to work together sometimes with that. So and it helps them actually get over the fear of actually coding. And this is it's gender neutral, the fear of coding. Um, so this kind of way where they can see where their errors are, the actual help that was it, that is in within Greenfoot is actually quite useful. So, but I've got, um, so in what I do when I'm teaching, so I have a presentation which I'll show you kind of whip through, but I have, um, like the instructions for the particular zombie one that I did and it actually has the code printed out so instead of giving them a text file where they can copy and paste it I tend to do it as a PDF so they can't copy and paste it um, so they actually have to type it in because the more you type it in the more you get used to your own way of typing and you can fix your own errors a lot quicker whereas they copy and paste it so just, it's an exercise in copy and pasting um, so that's another thing is to make sure that if you do have any code that you have Either make sure it's in the file or make sure that they can't copy and paste it. Because <laughs> otherwise they'll just copy and paste it and then just start playing the game instead of actually learning how to use the code properly. So that's quite useful. And it's also, I've, I've broken it down so that by the end of, probably if it was a sort of secondary school class, it'd probably take four weeks. Mainly because you want to just do a little bit more than just the actual coding. Um, with the A-level classes, because they tend to be longer, you can get it done either within one or two lessons. So it just depends on how long your lessons are, how frequent they are, to actually um, making sure that they understand it. And one of the things that the students said was they can also see their mistakes here in terms of when they've actually added the, um, the new object to something else. By having the visual representation of the class hierarchy at school, it actually really helps them go, oh, actually, that shouldn't be there that should be somewhere else, it's not part of that, and then they can see where their errors are. And it's like, it's, only one, it's, only, it's the only one I've found that actually helps them understand the actual object or into concept of objects within a class hierarchy. So that was, that's really, really useful. So, whereas all the, if you think of like Python or, or programming in Java, you use something like Eclipse or IntelliJ, just a, or a text editor, whatever you want to use, you can't actually see this. And sometimes when you teach them without having a visual reference, it's really, really complicated to actually explain that sort of abstract concept without playing with Lego. And that's, everyone likes playing with Lego, no matter if they're 20 or two. So that's another thing to do, is get them to do kind of physical ways of understanding their concepts. Because it's, the abstract concepts are quite hard for them to grasp initially, but whereas if you've got a visual thing, it actually makes it much easier for them to understand um, I mean, there are other tools as well, but this one's just really, really useful from a teaching perspective because in terms of assessment, their understanding their concepts, it's very good for you to use it. Um, there's another thing I want, there is lots of other resources and there's another one which is really good because um, the resource itself isn't the best, it hasn't been written the best, but the actual um, link to industry is really good. It's done by BEMA, which is the British Interactive Media Association. 
Um, and they run a competition um, like once a year, and it's called like it's like it's called D Day, and it's like a design challenge day. So they have like app development and all of those other things. But one of them, they have a coding challenge which uses Greenfoot, and they have this, which is an available as a PDF for everyone, and it's got loads of instructions in there that I that are all kind of kind of from the book, you can see like I've kind of screenshotted the same things. So this is a really, and it's a free PDF, you can just go on the website and get it, and um, I'll, I'll tweet the link out later. The only thing is, is the problem with it, it's incredibly text heavy, so you would have to make sure that it was kind of like a secondary resource. Some of the language in there I think sometimes is a bit difficult for younger learners, and anyone that's got a literacy issue, um, there's just way too much text when you want them to actually just get on and do some work. But it's a very useful tool because all of the pictures are in there, which is quite hard to get hold of instead of you screenshotting everything. So, but I'll just show you how I deliver the zombie one instead of the crabs and the worms one, which is uh, quite useful to do. So, oh, hang on. I'm on my green phone. Sorry. <laughs> So, in terms of how I initially did the green foot file, it's, I have, you can see here, so um, what I did was I set up the um, zombie folder for them with a broken project. So they have all of the text that they need in terms of the particular mover class, which is not something new, so they actually created their own new class. Um, and in order to do that, it can be quite complicated, so I actually gave them the text for that. And you can see that there's, uh, there's lots of images as well, so they start with it. So this is the one that I did, as opposed to the one that my students did, which I used um, earlier to demonstrate it. So it will load, it'll just take a minute or two. So you can see here that it's really dark, actually, but it's a really dark background with lava and things like that, but you can't quite see it. Um, and then you can see here, I've got the same, but I don't have the mover class here. So this is the one that they get initially from me, it's like a templated one. And then from that you can see what that student created. Completely different, totally different background, different icons. And, and it was just literally that, by having a skeleton to work from, they can easily change it, and, but they're still using the same bits of code. But I think it's very hard if you just went, here's green foot, off you go, let's do this. Having a skeleton is actually really, really useful for people to do. And if some of them weren't confident, they can just use your program and then go through it. So here you'll see that it's completely empty. So this is what you start with, and then with the other program, they built in all of those things based on my worksheet, which they couldn't copy and paste. But this is, I mean, you, the whole thing's done already. Um, so you don't, you can just have it. So. And what they do is they just work independently through it. And some of it is a little bit complicated, um, certainly in terms of the, um, when you're creating the end section. Um, with my A-level students, what I do is we look at the sort of Boolean operators, because I find that one of the things that they find very, very difficult is to understand the sort of Boolean algebra and things like that. So there's another thing that I do in terms of teaching those concepts is trying to get those Boolean operators in there, in the gamifying it. So it, it really, really helps them kind of take the, again, the sort of abstract concept of the algebra into something that they're doing themselves. Um, even though we're talking about Greenfoot, another way to do that particularly is to use Scratch and Pac-Man. There's a Pac-Man game that you can create using Boolean algebra and De Morgan's law um, that university professors have done in Asia. So it's just by taking away the kind of coding element and using the code in sense or the actual software to help them understand the concepts is really good as well. So, and then there is another one that I just wanted to show you. So, um, and this is quite useful when you're doing kind of level, you know, when they want to do levels and multi-level things and also limits. A lot of the time they want to go, well I don't want, I want to kind of just go within a range, so you can talk about mathematical ranges. <coughs> and here you can see straight away that you've got the main race world and the uh, multi-level one by just creating an, um, like a super class, it's called. 
So you can see straight away, race world is the super class, and of that you've got two other classes, which is level one and level two. I mean, if, I'm not trying to patronise. If you know all this, that's great. I'm just kind of making sure that you understand it. And then this is really good by having the same super class, which is where you get your sort of enemy fighters and things like that. You can apply different mathematical values to them. So when they're doing scoring and things like that, they can return any target can be five points. But you can say every time they get food, it can be like negative five or it can be positive five, and you can assign a value to, say, just one. If all the rest of them are worth five, you only need to edit the code on the one that's different. And that's quite useful for the students to understand that they don't need to code everything on every single object, and it actually helps them understand the relationships between the objects. Um, so you can see we did different things to show le level counters, so like we did dots, because some people didn't, were trying to um, um, check out different ways. And initially they were trying to code them directly on the level world when actually they're an object in the world. And it's quite good to show how actually that's just the main world area and that if it's anything that's happening and independent of just that world, then it needs to be of its own object in here. So but if you let them trial it out, it's really good. So here, this is like a little car game that works on the limiting on the, um, there's two ways we did this. One was sensing the colour, so between green and black, and another one was sensing the kind of X, Y coordinates as well. So there's two ways that they could do this. So this is where I try and do it. So you can see like it's got minus five, I'm trying to get the fruit. So it's just a little game. And then you can, it, it, obviously I need to try and get some points to get to the next level. So, and that was quite useful for the students to kind of go, when they're thinking about doing their own kind of challenges, that, um, and again, we gave them this with half stuff, and then we said one of the improvements would be to give them the representation that, of movement. So they created this object and made it kind of scroll past the world edge and just loop back around, and it gives you the impression of actually movement within the car, because that's quite hard. Um, to do when you just when you can't see it, it doesn't give you the impression that you've actually got good gameplay. So in terms of bringing out gameplay into it, and that's quite a simple little code. They did that all themselves in terms of, you know, they created the object. They had to work out how what they would do in terms of making sure that the uh, object looked like. I mean, sometimes it didn't quite work because they hadn't coded it correctly or they overlapped some of the stuff. So, um, and that's object entry program in Java in half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> which is not very long. So has anyone got any questions in terms of uh, using Greenfoot in the classroom? Yeah? Can we have your Twitter yeah. so that we can follow you? Oh yeah, my, my Twitter handle, and I'm very, not very good at doing that, is um, at peglegjen, which is <laughs> for obvious reasons. I'm allowed to take, I'm allowed to do that. I'm, I, can, I can laugh at my own disability.